So you've probably heard about the OIPC investigation report into Babylon Health. So this is a great demonstration on why it is so important to ensure that you have your current information management agreements with your vendors in place. I'll share some tips to help you keep current and why it's important to the protection of patient information and the reputation of your business. You are listening to Practice Management Nuggets Podcasts, tips to help you start, grow, and improve your healthcare practice and your career. I help you manage the pink elephant in the room. Get the show notes from our website at practicemanagementnuggets.live. So again, just as a reminder, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV or on a podcast. These are my resources and my recommendations for you. Okay, so let's take a look at the commissioner's report for Babylon Health. So there are so many useful notes looking at investigators' reports that we can use to improve and our policies and procedures, um, to validate our information management agreements, to improve our privacy and security awareness training, um, and look at some key points that we want to get some further clarification about, for example, the data storage requirements outside of Alberta and the key criteria that the commissioner's office are using to review your privacy impact assessments. Now, by way of background, in April 2021, many clinics were struggling to find a way to provide virtual care to patients during COVID. Um, many vendors were scrambling to offer virtual care solutions. Now, many virtual care and telehealth uh, platforms have been around for a long time, and the pa pandemic provided a formerly unknown demand for these services. Now, we know that telehealth solutions have many EMR products. At some point, and I'm not sure when, um, TELUS acquired Babylon Health, and this was originally developed in the UK. At the beginning of the pandemic, TELUS rolled out Babylon and hired or contracted with Alberta physicians to provide virtual health services. Soon after, the OIPC received specific privacy complaints from members of the public. This prompted the OIPC to begin an investigation. The investigation report is 80 or more pages, and I do encourage you to read through it for more information. You'll find a lot of really useful tips, a sample of wording to use in your policies and procedures and your privacy impact assessment. Today, I want to use the investigation report to highlight uh, issues and topics that we can use as guidelines to help us better prepare our privacy impact assessment submissions. Now, the OIPC investigation report is called H for the Health Information Act 2021-IR-01. And this was published in July 29th, 2021. Um, and the investigation report is Babylon Health Canada Limited et al. So the commissioner issued its findings and recommendations after investigating the Babylon Vitalis Health app under the Health Information Act. There were eight findings and 11 recommendations made in this investigation. So the commissioner's um, investigator identified six key issues in the um, investigation that the investigator needed to establish or to be able to um, investigate during the, during the investigation. So um, there are summarized in the investigator's report. And I want to review some key points as it relates to how we can use it for the privacy impact assessments. So the first issue is, has the organization or has the custodians, remember it's always the responsibility of the custodians that are collecting, using and disclosing health information. Have the custodians established or adopted policies and procedures as required by section 63 of the Health Information Act. So this is your prompt to go to section 63 of the Health Information Act and see exactly what is required. Now, generally it is um, refers to the terminology of reasonable safeguards. And to determine what reasonable safeguards is, is, is to be aware about what is happening in the industry. And how do we do that? Well, we 
read investigation reports. Um, so this is where we help to establish what are expected reasonable safeguards in this industry at this point in time. So one of the requirements is that you must have re policies and procedures as per section 63 of the Health Information Act. And that's why the policies and procedures become the foundation of your privacy impact assessment. Your PIA says that I understand that section 63 says that I need to have them and here they are. The second issue is did the custodians, in this case, the physicians that were contracted or employees um, of TELUS, prepare privacy impact assessments as required by Section 64 of the Health Information Act? Now, many times people or physicians will hire um, consultants to do the privacy impact assessment or the vendors that they're working with will provide a privacy impact assessment but it is ultimately the responsibility of the custodians to ensure that a privacy impact assessment that meets all of the requirements is done and is been submitted to the privacy commissioner's office as set out in section 64 of the health information act now a big part of this particular investigation was the whole issue about is the dog wagging the tail or is the tail wagging the dog so yes, in this case, the vendor tell us provided a lot of the paperwork and the support to be able to do things, but what they weren't able to identify or, or weren't able to demonstrate um, is that the physicians were aware of, contributed and understood what the vendor was doing on their behalf. So tell us did prepare a privacy impact assessment um, early in the investigation or the rollout in, in April of 2021, and in fact, um, made a, a, amendments and, and um, improvements to the PIA and the submission as the year went on. But they could not demonstrate that they had communication with the physicians and that the physicians contributed to and understood what the vendor was submitting. So it's really important that you have demonstrated in your privacy impact assessment who is accountable for that privacy impact assessment. How are your physicians being made aware of that information? And how are you documenting that as you onboard new physicians in your organization that they are being made aware about that privacy impact assessment that you may have done last month, last year, or five years ago? So that's an important step to be able to ensure that you're documenting and as a procedure that you're going to implement in your practice. Have the custodians entered into agreements with the information manager as required by Section 66 of the HIA and Section 7.2 of the Health Information Regulation. So did the physician sign an information management agreement with TELUS Health? And then subsequently, was that information management agreement um, compliant with the requirements of the regulations? And in this case, um, it appeared that that did not happen. So it's very important that you make sure that you have your information management agreements current and up to date. And even though you don't usually submit the information management agreement to the commissioner's office as part of your PIA submission, when you document your privacy impact assessment, you need to make sure that you've got that document in front of you, that information management agreement as part of your supporting documents. The commissioner's office has been requesting after the PIA submitted to also receive a copy of the information management agreement. And this is a trend that I've been seeing over the last year. Now, for you creating the privacy impact assessment, you want to make sure that there is an IMA that is done and that the IMA is current and meets the requirements of the regulations. Now, some it is ultimately the responsibility of the custodian to ensure that the IMA meets those requirements. Oftentimes, a vendor will provide an information management agreement for the custodian to sign. And that's great. I think vendors that offer those documents to get started um, are really taking an opportunity to prove to the, to the custodians um, who they want to sell to that they understand what those requirements are and that they have um, assisted the physician to be able to meet those requirements. On the flip side, if the information management agreement that the vendor is providing to the physician is not meeting the requirements of the health information regulation, then the physician needs to either A, take a, uh, the responsibility for 
implementing a system that they know is not compliant, or B, working with the vendor to ensure that they update their documents and that it is compliant with the Health Information Act. Um, so I know that working with vendors can be challenging and sometimes the bigger the vendor, the harder it is to ensure that there is compliant for your local regulations or your provincial regulations. But it is a step that you need to consider before you are selecting the vendor for your EMR system or your appointment reminder system or whatever implementation that you're looking at. You need to see those documents before you commit to the project to ensure that it meets those requirements of the legislation or you're going to be in a pickle just like this. Um, now, in this particular instance, when Babylon Health implementation started, the data was being stored outside of Canada. Now, there is opportunity for an organization to store data outside of Canada, but in my opinion, the regulations and the um, degree of difficulty in being able to prove that it's appropriate and cannot be done inside Canada at a lesser risk just make it almost impossible to, to use a system that's outside of Canada. We have so many good systems inside of Canada that going the extra mile or the rec extra hundred miles to prove that a system outside of Canada is better than what you're doing internally um, is a challenge. So I don't believe in most cases that there is a need to go outside of Canada unless you've got something really unique and special. And if you are going to outside of Canada, you need to demonstrate in your privacy impact assessment and privacy risks that the information is going to be safe outside of that jurisdiction. And they did not meet that standard in this investigation report. Now, subsequently, TELUS did move all of the data into Alberta at their TELUS data centers, I'm assuming. Um, so that particular issue was resolved by having the data inside of Alberta. Now, in the investigation report, the requirements to maintain administrative and technical um, safeguards. And this all centered around making sure that there are written policies and procedures um, for the use of collection and disclosure of health information that had enough specific detail about how you were going to do that within the application, within Babylon Health, and specifically, how did that relate to meeting those requirements from the regulations and the act in Alberta. So having a generic um, user manual from the vendor about how to use the application without addressing how you're going to protect the privacy of, of individuals and the privacy of the healthcare providers and who is responsible and specifically tying it to the specific sections of the Health Information Act is a requirement. So just having that user manual is not good enough. You have to tie it in and make sure that it is um, specific to the legislation and that the physicians have agreed to that information and that they have authorized it to be used in that way. So in the sixth issue was, is the collection use and disclosure of health information in a limited manner. So there was a big discussion about how information is being collected. Now, is in the virtual care environment, they needed to verify the identity of individuals. So what they did at this point is that the individuals, the patients, had to provide a, a copy or an image that they uploaded of their driver's license into the Babylon Health application. So the commissioner had a significant issue with the information about government issued photo ID being stored in the Babylon Health data center. Um, so what was in the recommendation specifically about this was that there are other less intrusive um, ways to be able to verify patient's identity. And the common recommendation is, you know, you can have the patient on the virtual call on Babylon Health or whatever app that you're using and have them share their photo ID as part of the um, introduction. So you see the picture over here and you see my face and you go, okay, that looks like Gina on a bad hair day. Um, but, and then the other part was the physicians or the application were automatically recording both the audio and the video of the virtual health. And that was more um, um, 
more information that was required to be able to provide that health service. So you can have that video conversation and um, do that in a synchronous real-time um, format and not store that information. The other piece with that uh, was the geolocation. So as part of the app, the patient would uh, download the app on their phone and it would record specifically where the patient was in that time that they were having the consultation. So there was a need to be able to demonstrate that the patient was physically in Alberta so that the uh, regulations about the geographic area where the physician was licensed and that they were licensed to provide services to patients in that same geographic area were met. Um, but it was not required to know exactly on what street or what GPS coordinates um, that patient was at the time that they had the uh, conversation bar with the app. So there was extra information that was being collected and um, could not demonstrate that there was a specific purpose or need to be able to collect that information. So again, the privacy principle of only collect the least amount of information necessary. So in the Privacy Commissioner's report, they had a number of recommendations, and there were 11 of them, and I'm going to review some of them quickly here for you, making sure that the policies and procedures are uh, relevant, um, approved, meets the requirements of the Health Information Act, and specifically talks about how is the application going to be used for the privacy collection and use of patients' information. Um, prepare and submit the privacy impact assessment. Enter and into an information management agreement that meets the requirements of the regulation. So um, there were 14 physicians, I think, that were involved in this at the, at the time of the report, and they had not individually signed an information management agreement with Telesouth. So they need to do that. That there needs to be privacy and security awareness training um, provided by Babylon and adopted by the physicians um, so that the physicians, their, their administrative assistants and other people that were involved had specific privacy and security awareness training for this project um, and general information privacy and security awareness training. Um, so if you're going to use a uh, project that is technology based, um, regardless of what the technology is, whether it's telehealth or um, remote monitoring for cardiac or, or, or anything else, if you're adding layers of technology, you need to add layers of training because there's always some additional privacy and security risks about that technology, whether you're working remotely from home or, or you know, any number of situations. So there's going to be some specific training that's required for that project. And they did not demonstrate that they have this in place. So you need to include that in your privacy impact assessment and in your policies and procedures. To develop and implement a proactive auditing process to ensure that people are using the information and accessing it um, on a need to know basis. And as technology advances, we're getting really good about creating ways that we can do user access auditing. So we need to implement that. We need to prevent problems. We need to identify problems um, before they are long-term. Um, we all know that we've got uh, snooping incidents that have been going on for um, many months and years. And uh, these are things that we can implement. These are the reasonable best standards to know that we should be doing these things. Um, so now it's time to actually do it to develop those proactive auditing um, for users, maintain modify confidentiality clauses and employment agreements to include specific relevant references to the Health Information Act. So in your oaths of confidentiality, in your employment agreements, it's not enough, good enough to have just, I agree not to tell anybody about my information, about the information that I've learned, is that you need to tie it in specifically to the Health Information Act. Under the Health Information Act in section 2434, I understand that this information cannot be shared while I'm an employee or after my employment. You need to get those specific words in place. So modify, um, discontinue the collection of government issued um, selfie photo IDs, um, discontinue the recording of audio and video during vi virtual consultations, and discontinue the collection of pre precise and approximate location of individuals. So use these tools as a checklist when you are developing your privacy impact assessment to know what the expected 
practices are in your policies and procedures that you need to have documented in your privacy impact assessment so that your PI submission goes through smoothly and you've met all the requirements um, under the legislation. Now, the Health Information Act um, obviously governs a lot of the information under the um, that Babylon Health had to meet, but Telus Health also has requirements under the PIPA legislation, under the Personal Information Protection Act, which is the private sector privacy legislation. So the commissioner's office actually conducted two investigations, one under the Health Information Act, which we've looked at, and the other under the PIPA legislation. So go to the commissioner's website and make sure that you download both investigation reports. Um, I'm not going to review the one specifically for PIPA. They are similar in context, uh, but of course, there are some very specific requirements that the vendor must meet. So take a look at those two investigation reports. Um, they are lengthy, but they have a lot of really good checkpoints that you can use to better understand and to improve your privacy impact assessments. Thank you for joining me for this Practice Management Nuggets podcast. If this has been helpful to you, please share this out with your friends. The next intake of the Practical Privacy Officer Strategies course will be opening soon. This includes five hours of live training with me to help privacy officers in healthcare practices in Canada prepare their privacy management plan and their privacy breach response. Join me for tips, tools, templates, and training to help you become a more confident privacy officer. Did you hear something on today's podcast that you would like to go back and listen to again? Or maybe you heard something on one of our previous podcasts, but you don't remember which one and you'd like to be able to find it quickly and easily. Well, that's easy to do now. If you heard something on this podcast that you want to revisit, go to practicemanagementnuggets.live forward slash search and enter the keyword in the magic box. You will be brought back to the podcast at the exact spot where we talked about it. This video keyword search tool uses the new Searchy app. If you would like to know more about this, visit informationmanagers.ca likes dash searchy that's s-e-a-r-c-h-i-e